like Showtime? What the hell are you talking about, bro? I can bro, tell you delirious. Nah, Showtime is lit, bro. It's like black joy in its like purest form. It ain't always black joy though. Sometimes it's they I mean it causes it, it it oh the, the showtime. You never seen that when they're like, oh, so we just they they'd be like, we just some black people. Like we could be robbing y'all. We could be killing y'all. Yeah. But, but those are the those are like the D train showtime people. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A train and the J train showtime people don't really be doing shit like that. Yeah. Do they got any any uh not any new you haven't seen before? Nah, I, I pretty much seen I like I recognize them at this point. It's a bunch of but every but every time I'm like, let me take off my headphones. A bunch of this. this nah, they don't be tutting. They more so like be doing handstands and, and jumping and sliding on the poles and shit oh and doing God. doing the flag. That shit's impressive, bro. I hate that strong. I don't know what you do. You hate about. it? Yes. That's impressive. Bro, it's I'm talent. Bro, for free. I'm if just you... trying to eat my Doritos and look at my text messages. I don't want a nigga sliding across on a damn pole. But that's your problem. You're eating City. Doritos on the train. You nasty. Is this a fucking strip club? Get off the pole, <laughs> you dirty bitch. I don't like any of that. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> nah, that's How you true. feeling? Um, I'm fucking tired. I was bro. about to say you yeah. look delirious, I'm, my brain. I'm, oops, I'm really tired. Um, been up since three in the morning, running around running city around. to city. Had a quick little, oh, city to city, yeah, you had type a quick shit, you know. What I'm saying? Saying? I just be, you know, you know how I do no, Yeah, you was but, on the. Uh, nah, I had to take a train down to DC and come right back. Yo, for, you took the train. I took an Amtrak. They're getting cheaper. I think they're realizing nobody can fucking afford uh 180 dollar tickets, but um, yeah, um. I came back to make sure we could, you know, stay consistent with this. Hey, that might, but yeah, last time I took the damn mega bus when I went back to DC, um, on my way back, I witnessed a fight. A fight broke out on the on the bus. On the bus? <laughs> on the bus. On the mega bus? Bro. On the mega bus. The double decker? Bro. Upstairs or downstairs? Upstairs. Oh my god! Right? It's not even. It's like I re I cannot stand up space. there. That's what I'm saying. There's literally not enough space. So they were like ducking in front of you. So like. All right, so pretty much what happened, uh, it and it didn't it didn't boil over. It did get physical. So pretty much there was a lady. She was asleep, and then about halfway through the trip, before we got to even Baltimore, so we were probably like almost an hour in. Mm -hmm. She goes to put her seat back, and there is an Asian gentleman behind her with her with his knees up on the seat, pretty much preventing her from putting her seat back. Mm -hmm. um, and so when she goes to put her seat back, she's like restricted and yeah. she gets up and she's like hey can you let me put my seat back and uh -huh. this is i don't know if this is what happened i had my headphones in but this is kind of what was conveyed to me after the fact mm -hmm. but she's like yeah can you let me put my seat back and apparently he said no why don't you just move to the seat next to you they both had free seats next to them keep this in mind for, okay. the, for the overall okay. conflict i know how right? it is yeah. <laughs> and she's like He's like, no, just move to the next seat. And she's like, no, I want to put, I want to sit by the window, and I just want to put my seat down. Why can't you just put your feet down? He's like, because I don't want to. Apparently, that's what he said. I don't want to put my feet down, and you can just move to the seat next to you and put the seat back. He he could have also did the same thing. He could have also did the same thing, but she could have, you know, I don't know, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So she gets up and she starts yelling in his face, like, "Yo, put your feet down." I want to put my seat back. What the hell is wrong with you? He's just looking at her at this point because now people are with his feet up. With his feet up, looking he's, stupid. He looks stupid in the first like, place. That there's no way that's comfortable. Exactly, exactly. I'm, this is exactly I'm how not he putting looks. My, not putting my feet up. <laughs> exactly right. Okay. And so, he's an asshole. And, and I wanna, yes, I want to. I want to pick my then, side now. But then, right. She he she notices that he's playing a Nintendo DS and she snatches it out of his <gasps> hand and immediately throws it across the bus right and it hits the window and like you know it fell apart that ins that ins so did that you see that I, that's where I jumped in yeah oh, that's pretty much I had my headphone going. in I heard kind of tensions being heightened in the background and as I was pulling out my headphone I saw the DS just fly across the bus and I'm like oh okay that's where we are in the, <laughs> the in Pokemon the Gold just like popped out literally like, <laughs> and, and he's like you broke my game you broke my game oh, like no and, uh, that's like all, the worst thing that's like worse it. than like. He was. She was. Oh, it she was exa He was definitely exaggerating, but I could see where he came from because at that moment he didn't really necessarily know if it was broken or not. Oh my god! His but, DS. Oh my god! And you could tell like <laughs> it was all he had, you know, that DS. So he was just really and and just the conflict just boiled over, boiled over to the point where they're screaming at each other. And luckily, we had a stop in Baltimore, and somebody came on the bus and kind of stopped that interaction from 
um, Escalate. escalating to any other point. Oh but I mean, pretty much she took his DS. She picked it up. She was like, it's not broken and held it for the rest of the ride until we got into to Baltimore. Oh so my like, God. So he just let her take it? Literally just let her take it. She kind of. That's what he get. Yeah, low key. But, but that's, that's pretty aggressive on her. That could have ended really. And I'm like, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, if y'all make this bus pull over, I'm beating both of y'all. <laughs> like, I, You might be conflicted as to what you're listening to, what you're looking at at the moment. Sorry about that. You know us. We get straight to it. But if there is any confusion, I'm going to go ahead and clear that up because you know I do it week to week. You should know by now. But if you don't, what is this? Where is this? It's... Evil, Evil, Evil Hour podcast program, audio show, whatever you want to call it, where every episode is the first episode. We'll close Cody Manawi. I'm your host, Knight. Welcome back. Welcome uh, back. Welcome back. Another one. You already know. Yes, you man. already know the overthinker's paradise, the brash and comedic exploration of the human psyche. Thank you for allowing us back in your ears and your eyes or wherever you're you know, taking in this content from. Pause. Thank you. Thank you again. Pause. Yes. So getting back to that. <laughs> yes. Let's 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 talk about conflict. Let's because jump right into there's it. a couple there's a, like a lot of things I want to discuss. Mm-hmm. Um and I also think that you couldn't be talking to two better people about this situation, specifically about conflict, because between the two of us, I think you have the two opposite ends of the spectrum. You have you, who I wouldn't say that you seek conflict, but what I would say is that I have seen you almost beat up an old man before. That I didn't. I didn't almost beat him up. You did, and I and I knew you were gonna say that. And I didn't stop almost beat lying. Him up. I didn't stop. almost beat. You him did up. almost beat him he up. He was just being rude, and I had to like be like, yo, and you were like, yo, what's up? And he's like, and he's like looking at you like. You, what you, what's up? Like, what you about to say? Like, I'm like, oh my god. He no, he was just like, he like bumped into me on man. a on a wide ass train platform. Like, why? There was so many other places you could walk around, Look and it off. just felt like you he know, route up. Look at him. <laughs> you ready? I, I don't, I don't seek conflict. I'm just not afraid of conflict. That's okay. That's yeah, what I was saying. I mean, like, I, I don't, I don't mind conflict. It's, yeah, uh, it's kind of, I won't say exciting, but I, I would rather not back down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And then you have me. I'm on the other uh, uh, other opposite end of the spectrum. Somebody who's literally pretended to be blind to get out of a fight before. Fight, flight, or freeze. Fight. Flight. If I'm ever in a conflict, I'm gonna keep going at it until like it's everything solved, cleared, or whatever it ends up to. Mostly, I will like either like talk it out or like find out why they like started the conflict and stuff. Would you rather not have to deal with the conflict? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Uh, I, like, I just, I just don't like, like yeah. deal with conflict. Yeah. The difference between both of them. Yeah. yeah. He's been with me, like, all of my conflicts. Yeah. And, like, one of our friends was on a corner. We were all in, like, a corner. And, like, a conflict sort of happened. We can't really talk on that too much. <laughs> okay. And then, basically, they pulled up with, like, a couple extra people. One of our friends got slapped and like I didn't see the slap personally. I was still in the deli. Okay. But yeah. And, and then and then later out. that night everything got resolved. resolved. Okay. In a way that y'all can't really speak. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Kind of okay. still have the bruises on their hand too. Okay. And what was your response? Uh, I kind of like stood back a little and mostly I didn't want to fight or yeah. do anything. But at the same time, I look back the other day. I'm like, damn, I should have like did something at least. Should have like fought back or like did anything because he got slapped my friend got slapped and we didn't do anything so did you was it a freeze kind of moment yeah but it wasn't a flight he, no no nothing wrong with that i've had those moments it I, happens i, I happens. feel your pain it doesn't happen it happens when you're a p- okay i tried to walk away from a conflict and that was the one time i got hit in the f- face oh my gosh that situation yeah oh we only so you know it's just that. like i probably should have done what i naturally would do yeah because i tried yeah. to be like you yeah, a bit. and then I got, <laughs> and I really turned into. It. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's oh, as always, we gotta lay the framework for the conversation. Yeah, we need formal definitions. Can you give me the formal definition? Yes, of sir. Yes, sir. Conflict, yes, sir. Please. We have three that we put into our notes. Um, so the first one we have conflict: a serious disagreement or argument 
typically a protracted one. We also have a condition in which a person experiences a clash of opposing wishes or needs and an incompatibility between two or more opinions, principles, or interests. Awesome. Um, a lot of it's centering around some dissonance, some, uh, you know, things not being in sync. I think that comes I think that's to, a good way to boil it down. Yeah, yeah for sure. Down to that. And there's a lot of different ideas, especially around the overall physiology when it comes to our brains. Oh, for sure. And how they handle conflict. Mm -hmm. um, but I think... To put it simply, it can be boiled down to two main ideas and when two, it comes to two parts of the brain. Yeah, when it comes to the physiology, right? When yeah. the two parts of the brain, we have the amygdala mm -hmm. and we have the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, so right? tell me about the amygdala. The amygdala is a small almond shaped section of your brain. Almond. And this is pretty much used as the threat detector, right? Yeah. It is the thing that's analyzing those threats and it's either going to trigger an emotional response whether it be anger it can be you know fear it can be yeah. either one of those yeah and it does that by releasing chemicals in your blood like adrenaline and cortisol exactly and so then we have the prefrontal cortex exactly. right here in our noggin right develops With, at 25 yes and 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 that is a good note, right? Because the prefrontal cortex is pretty much in charge of all the executive functions. Mm -hmm. It is in charge of, you know, decision making, rational, making rational decisions, complex thinking, complex thinking, okay. social situations, you know, putting things in context mm -hmm. and assessing though and also assisting in assessing those threats, right? And yeah. what you should do in those situations. Yeah. So you noted that. Um, your prefrontal cortex does not get developed until you're 25, and that yeah. makes sense why a lot of younger people are more emotional. For sure. They, they find themselves in these situations a lot more because yeah. that prefrontal cortex and that rational decision-making making part of their brain hasn't fully developed yet. Yeah, some people kind of define the difference between like a child and adult is whether they're operating based off of their emotions or off of you know logic and reason that they get from the prefrontal cortex and... You know, they they tend to say like being an adult is twenty one, but I would more say more so say like really you really hit adulthood at twenty five, and that's how I feel like from my experience too. Same, yeah. Like you know, twenty one, you're just like an older kid. You're you still know? a yeah, you're yeah. still a teenager. You don't really, don't you don't really feel your age until twenty five, and you almost literally feel the last neurons like connect develop, yeah, at, right on your twenty fifth birthday. It's a very funny experience. I felt that some people. Yeah. Have you know, say that they don't necessarily feel the difference. I definitely, I, definitely I felt did. like this overwhelming sense of like responsibility more. Like, yeah. like I felt more in control of like my motor functions. Like, like yeah, I felt like it was it was a bit grounding. Um, yeah, for to sure, to say the least. Um, but the the and then the mag the amygdala that we were talking about earlier um, that's responsible for that those fight or flight um, reflexes. Um, that is often triggered during conflict and it yeah. you know when that happens um it actually inhibits your prefrontal cortex from functioning um because you know it takes a little bit longer time for your prefrontal cortex to process information mm -hmm. as opposed to when you react um out of your emotions whether you know fear or anger um within a conflict um it you're much quicker to react and it's you know down to our biology and where we come from that was very important development right right in our physiology because if a tiger is running straight at you yeah you can't be you, like what do i feel you really about can't think this hmm, right maybe now. should i jump over mm. the tiger should i you know try to kick the tiger you just go straight into fight or flight right um but you know as we develop and we're not surrounded by wild animals who may try to kill us um, some of that it becomes a little bit outdated yeah and, and drives us into situations that are not necessary yeah exactly fight flight or freeze it's like impulse to just freeze for me personally when i just freeze to think about what to do in the next moment so it's how you process information you kind of stop yeah and that's that's your natural tendency yeah but it also depends on the con like the conflict i definitely feel like it's evolved over the years like i feel like when i was younger i would freeze a lot more mm -hmm. instead of flighting like mm -hmm. what you said like just avoiding situations or like fight. I don't know. It really does depend on the conflict. Yeah. Like I feel like all, all three of those options are important. Like yeah. you're saying, they all have their place. They all have their place. Yeah. Because yeah. freezing, you have time to think, mm -hmm. and then flighting is just a way that you can avoid a situation that you don't like. It's another way to pick your battles. Mm -hmm. I feel like. 
That's a good way to say it. Yeah. I feel like in general, everything happens for a reason. So like conflict is like, conflict is necessary in life mm. to like get over mm. if that makes sense. So conflict can kind of spur growth in some areas. Yeah, that's how I feel. I don't have a specific example, but I'm sure I've had conflicts where it's like, I needed to have that conflict in order to like grow or get over something. So the amygdala causes you to act more impulsively and the prefrontal cortex steps in to kind of manage that response. So the amygdala ready, the amygdala like, what's, what, what, what yeah, you say? Right, right. And the prefrontal cortex is like, hold like, on. Okay, like, nah, I'm about to shoot this in the head right now. It's like, hold on, you're at work. Right. Prefrontal cortex, like, chill out. And your prefrontal cortex kind of acts as like that break um, to stop to you from- To slow down that- Right, from going response. over the ledge, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Turn your up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if you don't have that prefrontal cortex- It's a little bit harder. And some people, you know, especially if you don't give your brain a chance to develop, you don't practice these types of things yeah. and, and actually develop- you know, different ways of thinking, then you won't ever really be able to put those brakes on in situations and you tend to act like a child. Yeah. Or more so, you put yourself in situations that you nece necessarily didn't need to. Right. Especially when you're an adult. Um, you know, there's no real reason. There's rarely a reason. I won't say there's no real reason, but there's rarely a reason to get into, like, you know, that's violent conflict. That's a fact, yeah. Um, As I get older, I realize that more and more. So there's a lot of different theories and concepts around how humans uh, interact with conflict and how we deal with it. And I want to start diving into a couple of those concepts. We mm -hmm. won't get into all of them. Yeah. But the first one I want to start off with is the different types of conflict styles. That's yeah. something that we talked about during our research. Yeah, yeah. That that was a very interesting part. Um, and it, it, it derives from Thomas Kilman, mm -hmm. his conflict mode instrument or TKI. White man? Um, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> he identified five different styles of conflict resolution. And all these different styles are kind of characterized by the level of assertiveness and cooperation. Um, and mm -hmm. those five styles are competing, accommodating, avoiding, collaborating, and compromising. Um, okay. with, with competing, you have a high level of assertiveness and a low level of uh, cooperativeness. Mm. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Um, you know, those, that type of conflict um, style or, you know, that the way you handle that conflict is, you know, important in situations like sports when you're actually competing. Right, right, right. Um, but also it can it can happen in other situations uh, where you need to think really fastly and you don't have time to mm. take somebody else into consideration. Um, then the next type of way is called accommodating, um, in which uh, a lot of times it happens when you're not in a position of power. Um, and you act on a low level of assertiveness and a high level of cooperativeness. Okay, pretty self-explanatory as well, so, yeah. Yep. And then we have um, avoiding um, the conflict. Um, we see that in avoidant, avoidant um, attachment styles and things like that, mm -hmm. where you have both a low level of assertiveness and a low level of cooperativeness. You just kind of remove yourself, you avoid mm -hmm. it. And a high level of business, you can say it. Yeah, just Me. like you. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> um, <laughs> then we have um, collaborating which is both a high level of assertiveness and a high level of um, cooperativeness um, in which you actively um, collaborate, you actively worked with the person or the thing or the situation that you're in conflict with, and you both assert yourself and your needs and you also cooperate and take into account their, um, their needs and wants. Um, and then the fifth one is uh, compromising where you have a moderate level of both assertiveness and cooperativeness. Um, and that's when you kind of come to a middle ground. Hmm. Um, you don't uh, completely bend over and you don't completely assert yourself. Is that the is that the one we're all kind of trying to get to? Or do, would you say that certain things call for certain situations? Exactly. Cer certain situations call for uh, certain styles um, in conflict resolution or, uh, you know, how you handle and perceive that conflict. I can't say that just from from looking at it, I don't think there's one that's the best. You know, relationships, most of the time you would want to either accommodate or compromise. Right. 
um, or actually collaborate and, you know, find, collaborate probably. Yeah. yeah, it's probably the best one. Um, but, you know, when you're playing sports, you probably don't want to collaborate yeah, so much. Be accommodating. Or, like. Yeah, or, you know, if you're competing, you have some type of um, the stakes are high and you're trying to win or, you know, come out on top of the situation. That's interesting. Yeah, I feel like that does kind of boil them all down when it comes yeah, to it, it kind of puts stuff. everything in its in its place. And uh, I think uh, understanding the different types is important, especially when it comes to, you know, people you care about. Um, and then also if you're in a leadership position, uh, how do you handle those you know, those conflicts between you and the people that you're leading, you know, there's some times where you have to be more assertive um, in order to get you, you and your team across the finish line. But, you know, there's other times where you need to accommodate in order to, you know, yeah, give you somebody, some, you know, give somebody some power or allow people to feel empowered. Yeah. Um. So, you know, every, every situation kind of call, you know, that's where discernment and that prefrontal cortex kind of comes, comes into in play. handy. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about is something called transactional analysis, mm -hmm. right? Now I can read the definition for this. Yeah, I, I, I got you. I'm very, I'm, I'm excited to hear you. I like this one too yeah. because I, I, I feel like this is one of the things that I see the most relevant when it comes to conflict and just heightened interactions overall. Why you say that? I'll, I'll tell you. Why. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, the concept of transactional analysis states that this is a psychoanalytic theory that suggests that social transactions are analyzed to determine the ego state of the communicator, to determine whether it's parent-like, child-like, or adult-like hmm. as a basis for understanding behavior. In a conflict situation, individuals may communicate in a parent-to-child or a child-to-parent manner rather than an adult-to-adult -adult manner which therefore exacerbates hmm. the conflict. And that's that's really interesting because it kind of focuses on the ego. Yes. Focuses on how somebody is perceiving themselves in the conflict. In the conflict, right. Yeah. yeah. And then I, and I see this a lot, especially with conflicts. I mean, you know, in relationships, but just in conflicts in general. Mm -hmm. When people, when... Uh, emotions start to heighten, and that and that amygdala starts to take over, and those and those uh, stress responses start to settle in. You start to see people talk to each other a little crazy, right? Start yeah. sunning them. You start you start talking to them almost like in a parent to child manner. Mm -hmm. Like, are you f***ing stupid? Are you stupid? Let me let me explain it to you like this. Yeah, right? it's like, like condescending. Condescending, yeah, right? Talking at somebody, or or you could do it the other. It's there's a lot of different. I always notice during those conflicting situations that you know the way that we speak to each other alters and i think that whole concept of transactional analysis is super relevant because mm -hmm. you break it down to all right at the end of the day are is it two adults having an interaction and right. how are you communicating your points are you treating this person as an adult and giving them the level of autonomy and respect and respect yeah. key point key word yeah. in that interaction because yeah. if not then you need to start with yourself first when you're in a conflict do you fight flight or freeze flight i'm a flight you're a flight yeah it depends Okay, so so people have been saying it depends. What does it depend on? Who I'm fighting with, like the bond that I have with that person. If I really care about them, if I treasure the bond that we have, I'll probably try to talk through it. But if it's like a new person that I just met, definitely flight. Mm. But also if it's someone that I really know really well and they did something really fucked up, flight. So your natural tendency is avoidance then? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. flight. Yeah, no, <laughs> just, no, 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 you're right. You're I don't right. want to reword it for you. Yeah, but, no, you're right. Okay, and I, and I share that as well. So what about you? I would say for me, there's also a distinction on my reaction based on whether or not it's like online or in person. I think if I'm mm. having like a conflict that's like over like text message with like a friend or something, I'm definitely a lot more prone to flight mm. and just leaving the situation just because I think it's so much easier yeah. to just exit out of the conversation because I think social media has made it so that we can just choose whether or not we want to approach a situation or not, whether, we not, whether or not we want to leave it if we get uncomfortable. So I think a lot of the times when I'm in conversations that are difficult with like friends over text message, I'm definitely the one to just leave on delivered. Interesting. Leave. I think that there's something positive to that as well because, oh, well, I don't know about leaving on delivered in the middle of a conversation, but I think it is helpful to be able to just step back for a yeah. second 
step away from the situation and then I have time to kind of process it on my own and then come back to it. I can so I do that. think it's like a double-ended thing where it's like a, can it enable like the flighty tendencies maybe, but also I think it's important because I do think that when I'm dealing with conflict and like in real life, because I can't really directly leave the situation, I'm a lot more prone to like saying things I don't mean in the moment mm. or maybe lashing out just because the situation is right there. But whereas online, I can take the time to like, I don't know, leave and deliver it, whatever. But I have the time to reflect on it on myself and then come back to it with a more level-headed mind. Can y'all think of a situation where you handled a situation um, in a way where you wanted to handle it better? If I'm like fighting with my parents, for example, it's a lot easier for me to say stuff that I don't mean. Just because I think that I get more defensive easily when I'm in that conflict. It's easier for me to just lash into like defending myself yeah. and saying things that don't really address the actual root of the problem. Yeah. In that situation, it feels more like a, it's you versus me rather than a let's try to work together wow. towards fixing something. So I think when I reflect back on those conversations, it's like a, yeah, that wasn't really productive for either of us. I mean, with friends, it's, com it's completely different. Because yeah. I think with friends, I want to work on it and I want to like wow. still being their friend. And with family, I don't really have an option. Like right. I can't just choose for you to not be my family. Like yeah. you're my family. I value my friendships. I guess more because I'm like, mm. that's who I want around me. Yeah, like, you, I'm picking you selected. You. Yeah, and I think the interesting part about it is we have like unique relationships with everybody. So how you are in a conflict, how me and you handle conflicts may be different than how we handle conflicts with, you know, our partners, yeah. maybe with other friends, um, younger siblings, older yeah. people in our lives. That's weird. Why? So, Cause like, how I might handle a conflict with you is like very straightforward. Yeah. It's like I might I might just tell you and we I feel like we get to the resolution a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to like a, a romantic partner or, you know, maybe a business partner or mm -hmm. something like that, it's a lot more difficult. I don't I I can't Yeah, I mean Why I think I think there's not a lot of ego in me and your friendship, so like ironically. But <laughs> <laughs> um and I think with different people, they can trigger certain feelings. Like with our romantic partners, depending on, and I won't talk too specifically on my case, but mm -hmm. with our romantic partners, we may feel like they have more power over us. And so we mm -hmm. kind of fall into this childlike, like just, you know, maybe more accommodating. Mm -hmm. and parent allowed, to child dynamic. Or that would be a child to parent. Child to parent. From, from mm -hmm. you know, my perspective, if I felt like my partner had more power over me. Um, and then I may be more accommodating. We go back to the styles mm. and I just allow them to kind of, you know, rule over me. Or it may be a situation where I may not have as much respect for my partner and I start to speak down on them right. and I start to, you know, be a little bit condescending because I see myself as over them. And then right. that would come into like a parent like or a parent to child um, type of, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. conflict. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, or maybe it's like you know, the younger sibling where you do like a parent to child um, type of uh, how are we calling um, type of transaction, transaction. Yeah. yeah, you know, some exactly. type of transaction. You may talk to your younger sibling like a parent when you know they're a grown they're, adult. Yeah, 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 they're the same age. Exactly. Or you have an older sibling or an uncle who likes to talk down on you, even though like you both are adults at this point in your life. This kind of factors into the next point, which we won't go too deep into this concept, but I did want to just mention it, the overall concept of mirror neurons and empathy. We, we uh, contain yeah, yeah, yeah. these cells that tend to uh, mirror and uh, actions and you know, whenever we see an action being performed, we have these neurons in our brain that kind of at attach to those things. Yeah, and you kind of put yourself in, in that. that yeah, in that same position, which is something that is um, utilized when you ever you're having empathy. And yeah. empathy is a huge determining factor when it comes to de-escalating things because, yeah, and, yeah. you know, putting yourself in another person's position. Uh, perspective and right. seeing it from their point of view is one of the key elements of de-escalating situations. But the interesting part about it is I feel like in a way it can backfire because hmm. we may assume somebody to handle a situation or a conflict in the way that we would and we try to um, 
we would expect them to react in a certain way. But when they don't react in that certain way, I feel like that also creates like an inner conflict and confusion, some type of right. dissonance in our head. So maybe you're somebody well. who's competitive and that's how you typically handle conflicts amongst you and your family or amongst you and your friend group. But if you try to do that with somebody you don't know as well and they their response is way different from what you expected then mm -hmm. you know it might result in the escalation of a conflict or right 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 like that. yeah okay. exactly, exactly yeah i get with that i get yeah. that but i do agree overall that um you know empathy is key yeah and then <laughs> the i mean in my situation it was you know with the the dude like jacking up his girl like you know that was a bit triggering for me mm -hmm. seeing somebody be helpless and not have anybody step up and so in that instance, it was like, oh, well, I should probably step up. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, my empathy was kind of pulled out because I felt like she was helpless. Yeah, you saw yourself as her in that moment, weirdly enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. There's conflict resolution and how we get to that. But I also think that um, there's a deeper part of that, you know. To conflict resolution, there's something beyond actually I think there's something beyond. Conflict. Exactly. Because, you know, depending on the situation, it may spiral out of control or may spiral in, into control depending on how one reacts to a situation mm, isn't that a isn't that one of the like the conflict spiral theory or something like yeah, that? yeah it actually is so um, those things so thing interactions like that are often uh cyclical it often yeah but they they can they can spiral out of control which most of us have definitely witnessed uh, um or they can kind of de-escalate in the same accelerating fashion to gotcha. where things slow like fastly get resolved and that's the ideal situation oddly enough like with with my most recent partner that was something that we really got down very well is that how to spiral conversations into control mm. um and it was it was the first time i ever really experienced a situation where when i was in a conflict with somebody it re it always resolved quickly what is the key elements of having something spiral into control? The first thing I thought was like having things, taking away the stakes, making it a little bit lighter so that you're able to, so that you're not triggering or triggering that amygdala and that you're able to like approach situations from a calm standpoint and not have these heightened emotions. So maybe approaching things with humor. But what are what are some ways to have things spiral into control? That's interesting. Um, I think one thing that we were really good at was open dialogue about, you know, what we were feeling. Being able to say, like, this is making me feel this way instead of saying you're doing this to ooh, me. Ooh, it, was, nice. it actually, oddly enough, solving the problem was easier talking about what we were experiencing in our own heads because then you can see where the the divide is between the two like, yeah you can see okay where you're you experiencing that. this yeah. but that's not even what i was trying to right, do right here. right you know right I mean? right and that's very good that you're not labeling them as this you are doing this to me some it's, it's important that they know how they're making you feel but that is a very good distinction of saying this is how i feel right now i'm not necessarily trying to make you feel blamed for it and of course this has to occur with somebody that you trust because somebody could easily just take advantage of your vulnerability in that moment oh yeah of course and that happens sometimes in emotional relationships or uh you know relationships overall you mm -hmm. express that vulnerability and they're like you a bitch and you wrong like right, 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 right. for sure, <laughs> you for, know? sure for sure um but yeah i mean it, it does require that bit of trust and cooperation um and yeah like i said shifting the attention towards what you're experiencing from them and, you know, you can still hold them accountable because people need to be accountable for their actions, whether they meant that or not. Sure. Um, there's, you know, a lot of people say, well, I didn't mean to do that. That's not even what I was trying to do. And they think that absolves them from any accountability from how you made somebody feel, mm -hmm. which, and you know, there's a there's a definitely a line in between that because you can't always be responsible for somebody's reaction to, you know, Very what true. you say or what you feel. But if you care about them and there's space for you to understand and compromise with them, it's important to acknowledge that and to take that into consideration. When you're in a conflict, do you tend to fight, flight, or freeze? It can be a physical conflict, it can be an emotional conflict, just tend, when you have any type of conflict, any type of like butting of heads, okay. what is your tendency? Well, I feel like the most common one that I encounter is just kind of like verbal conflict. Right. For me, I feel like it's, it's not really like fight or flight. It's more just kind of like, okay, here's where we are. What do you think? Can so, we talk so about it? So more like freeze. 
No, not mm. freeze. There's still action there. I just want to talk about it. Mm. Like, what do you think? Like, okay. I just feel like people aren't transparent enough. And if you can actually just sit down and be like, hey, this is what I feel. Mm. Can we work through this in a way that works for both of us? Then great. And if not, then like maybe we need to part ways. I would just say it's like action via inquiry about how you're feeling mm. and how we can make this work for both of us in a way that is healthy. Has that has that style developed over time? Were you always like that? Um, I think it's developed like especially like I think when I went to college That's before I that I had just left like high school and like it was an interesting vibe like just in general mm -hmm. um, and I was opened up to new friends who like taught me new ways to be and this is kind of like what's come of it. How did you handle conflict before that? I, I would do the flight, flight thing. I didn't want to ruffle any feathers. I didn't want anyone to be upset. Mm -hmm. I just wanted everyone to be fine all the time. Now you don't give a f It's less about not giving a f I definitely do give a f If your emotions are going to be damaged and I care about you, I give a f Because mm -hmm. it's not just about me in this world. There are other people in this world and I live my life with love and that is something I care about. So it's more about like, how can we work this out yeah. in a way that is healthy for everybody? What do you think is the best way to handle conflict? Communication. Hmm. If there's no communication, then there has to be something else. I don't know what, because mm -hmm. I like, then you kind of getting into ethics, depending on like scales and stuff. Like for example, violence, when is it allowed and when not? Mm -hmm. But I think like mm. on the daily scale, interpersonally, communication is the best way to do it. I think you don't understand this because of this. It's like, well, let, I'll let them explain what, what they believe yeah. is the disconnect. Mm -hmm. uh, because whenever you start telling somebody about themselves, this is what you're doing to me, then it almost feels like, you know, well, you don't even know me. You're taking away my autonomy, you know, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. But very, very great points. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, and staying calm and present seems like the first you know, peace to all of this, but you kind of touched on this overall idea <clears throat> of something going beyond just conflict resolution. And I think you're referring to the overall concept of conflict transformation. Yeah. Right? And something like on a deeper level. Yeah. So I'll, I'll define conflict transformation. Okay. Um, so conflict transformation is a process of addressing a conflict in a way that seeks to change the underlying cause of the conflict um, conflict resolution typically is a one-off event and you just solve the problem and go from there. With conflict transformation, um, you're actually trying to get the root cause of it and prevent it from happening again. Hmm. And so, so is this on a societal? It can be, but it can also be for one-on-one -on -one relationships. You know, a lot we're, we're talking about romantic relationships a lot. And I think conflict transformation is really important in developing... Um, a it doesn't even have to be romantic, honestly. Developing any relationship yeah, yeah. Um, because you have to establish um, trust, like we were talking about earlier. You have to establish a clear line of communication with the person, understanding how people communicate and mm. how you communicate, and how that can be better. Um, and um, putting things in place, uh, whether it's on an institutional level or whether it's just you know boundaries right. um, between you and somebody those things are a part of conflict transformation because you're transforming this conflict into grounds of trust. You're transforming this mm -hmm. conflict into um, a way for you to actually be closer to somebody. And you're creating a deeper level of understanding exactly. in the process. For sure. And there's a lot of different ways you can kind of go about conflict transformation. We kind of touched on one, um, talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody and having, you know, a great dialogue with them. Right. Oh, uh, then, and then another one I think um, that I think you were about to get into was mm -hmm. the concept of narrative mediation. Yeah. And focusing on the stories that you're telling yourself about that person that you're having an interaction with. Mm -hmm. I get caught up in this a lot, especially when it comes to, you know, my partner. Um, even though we're literally bonded, I, and whenever we get into these heightened con conflicts in these situations, mm -hmm. for some reason, I start telling myself a different story, this narrative that I'm feeding myself that they don't care. They're, they did this on purpose. They wanted to make me upset. They, they, have, they have to know what they're doing. And this is really difficult when you start to uh, develop a, a longstanding relationship with somebody because you have the background thought that they, they should know. They yeah. should already know that, that, that I don't like that. Yeah, right? and they should and you know should, you by now. Right. And it's not it's not really fair. I mean, in some instances, you know, if you have some established 
uh, boundaries that are being crossed. That's one thing. But a lot of times we make the false assumption that somebody should know exactly what we think in every moment. Yeah, because you spend so much time with them that it's like it's it's hard to even, you know, you know, sometimes it's hard to even see the separation between you and that person. Right. And when you don't see the separation between you and that person, the moment that they break that connection can be very disturbing mm -hmm. and it can you know, it can cause you to really get heightened up, yeah, you know, get your, you. it trigger you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but there, you know, sometimes it's hard to work things out one-on-one -on -one with the person just through dialogue or, you know, through using your prefrontal cortex to think through it. Right. Um, and then in those types of cases, it's very helpful to have a third party come in, somebody who is neutral, who doesn't really have stakes in either one of you winning, uh, winning this, you know, conflict, right. um, and allowing you to allowing them to provide their outside perspective. Yeah, he did and, winning with air quotes by the, for the listeners, by the way. Yeah, it was, and it was, that's you're not winning. We want to come to some sort of uh, collaboration. The only win in a conflict is when both sides are are happy with the outcome, or you nice. you, know, you made a made a compromise that both of you can live with. Four. Um, that's the only way to really win. If somebody else is not feeling, you know, you may not always feel good after a conflict, but there should definitely be a ground of understanding. Right. And uh, we have the power to be able to navigate this too. Like yeah. we have. Especially as adults. Especially yes. As adults. And young yes. adults. I mean, like we're, you know. Yeah. If you're listening to this and you now, now you're aware, so you can't just keep getting away with, oh my, it was my amygdala. And like, now that you have the knowledge, you can't, you know now. <laughs> so it's like, try to make these steps of getting, cultivating a small level of detachment with you and your emotions, mm -hmm. creating that space for that prefrontal cortex to step in and be like, all right, let's, let's actually assess this situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that brings us to our last, uh, final point and that is the overall concept of peace building mm -hmm. we're talking about yeah that mean that for me that um it's it's a little bit in the vein of um having like a third party mediator oh okay. because a third party mediator it's kind of giving you the outside perspective so you two can solve the issue um with with that added perspective um, but then there's something called ar ar arbitration. I was trying to figure out how to pronounce this you word before. Right. Arbitration. My boy. Um, and it's kind of the same thing, but that third party um, is establishing what that that resolution is for the two parties. Um, that happens a lot in, in therapy, but then if we go to like a bigger perspective, we, we think about like peace treaties um, that happen in the world and, you know, with our governments. This is, it's the same thing. You know, you, you come in between, you know, two countries who are at long time disputes or, um, you know, if there's a war situation, you try to come together to create a peace treaty to, to have a compromise that both sides can live with and, and hold up and honor. Gotcha. Um, the interesting part is... Um, that is a very sensitive point in the conflict resolution because um, when people don't honor that agreement, yeah. it can almost exacerbate the, yeah. the conflict it and make it worse. a lot worse. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a very vulnerable time. But at the same way, uh, in the same vein, um, that same power can be transformative. Um, and can create a lot of peace. Yeah, create a lot. It can create a completely new understanding. And a, and a lot of times, you know, our interactions and our relationships are dictated by how we handle conflict. Mm -hmm. And you just as a person, you are going to be judged on how you handle conflict throughout life. So this is something that you want to start keeping in mind and keeping in mind the physiology and knowing that, you know, there are certain parts in your brain that are triggering you to do certain things. But just the overall awareness of that can help you, as we uh, prior stated, start to cultivate a level of detachment and start to really take control of these different aspects. Yeah, And the easiest way to kind of uh, calm down the amygdala and get back to your prefrontal cortex yeah, is literally just breathing. Mm. I mean, this is something that my mom's taught mm. me when I was mad young, and I didn't even realize how transformative mm -hmm. that hot word. I didn't realize how transformative that was. Like she used to tell me, because like, I used to have really bad like anger issues, and I would like, like, like just <laughs> I'm hyper beat up an old man right now, duh. <laughs> but, I'm beat up an old nigga. But um, it it literally takes ninety seconds to reset your brain. I mean, we don't always have that that leisure or that luxury to have 90 seconds to just breathe and calm ourselves down. But mm. even 20 seconds can be really transformative um, and calming us down and getting our nerves underway so we can think correctly. Um, so literally just taking 
10 to 20 deep breaths all the way in into your stomach and then out um, can calm you down so you can actually think about the issue at mm -hmm. mind and respond in a way that is not driven by emotion but is driven by reason, logic, and care um, nice. for yourself and the outside world. Just breathe. Just breathe. Just breathe. Ain't a how everything just come down to breathing always. Always. That's that's crazy, yeah. bruh. I think that's the name of the episode. Just breathe. But you feel good? I'm feeling good about this. You're not one. conflicted at all? No, I'm tired. You're tired? I'm that's tired. okay, bro. We we, but we did it. I definitely uh, handled the conflict of this terrible schedule. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm going to go sleep. You already know your boy wants to go to sleep, so we're going to get up <laughs> out of here. As you know, it's the Green Tea Goat. It's the Peach Tea Poppy. Mr. At Night Can't Rap. Uh, you know, Night Can't Talk. All social media. We got Big Dog Wolf on the ones and twos in the background. Yes, sir. This is and, Xavier uh, Cody. Xavier Cody on the TikToks and at Cody Manawi on everywhere else. You can call me Xavier. You should call me Cody. And that's all I got. Open your damn eyes. They said, well, we got two more seconds before we get out of here. As you know, this is the EBU Hour podcast program. The what? Show, whatever the EBU Hour podcast program or whatever you want to call it on all streaming platforms. Make sure you leave a review. Make sure you leave a comment. Keep that engagement going. Yes, sir. We're going strong. Do you At have a little? Evil Ego Hour. 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 And what is. The thing that we say at the end of every episode. Oh, uh, this is not professional medical or therapeutic advice. This is for your entertainment only. Please consult your therapist wherever problems you're having. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We stupid. and uh, yeah, we're we're just your friends. Yeah, we just talking shit, man. We just talking shit. We just your boys. You feel me? Your boys. Back at it next week. You already know what it is. Thank you for another. I always say you already know what it is. I know. I noticed that. Oh my god. You said it like seven times. Sick of myself. All right, y'all. We out of here. We're gonna have a conflict on that. Peace. Peace. <laughs> Woo. Hell yeah.